So what do we really talk about when we talk about soul? We use the word so much it seems we'd have a handle on it. We talk of beautiful souls, lost souls, soul food, soul mates. And yet somehow the more we talk, the greater the risk of falling into cliché. There's an easy sentimentality to the idea of someone being soulful, for instance. Or in the way my Irish mother used to forgive a rather tiresome acquaintance by saying, ah, but she's a good soul. <laughs> There's the pull letters of chicken soup for the soul territory. Soul is a soft concept. Be hard-headed about soul? You might as well try being hard-headed about puppies. Of course, lots of people have tried nonetheless. Descartes, for instance, he of I think, therefore I am, was convinced the soul was a physical entity and that it was embedded in the pineal gland, which is conveniently located right in the center of the brain. And a Massachusetts country doctor once claimed to have actually weighed the soul as it left the body at death. Three quarters of an ounce, he said. But since that didn't exactly roll off the tongue, popular legend went instead with the metric equivalent, 21 grams, which a few years back served as the title of a soul-searching movie. In fact, whole bodies used to be thought of as souls. Or rather, the body was incidental and the soul was all that mattered. There wasn't a soul in sight, someone might say, of an empty, lifeless street. And all souls were lost at sea. A statement that still makes me shiver, along with the emergency call, SOS, save our souls. The long arm of church doctrine reached deep, even going so far as to insist that a life lost could be a soul found. But what if we were to reclaim soul from the lost and found business? If we were to free it of pious modifiers such as blessed and immortal, because it hasn't always been the exclusive province of religion. Back when the wealthy ate goose for supper, the bird's lungs were called the soul. And to the medieval palate, they were the finest delicacy. And the word is still used for the sound post of a violin, the small peg hidden right underneath the bridge, which transmits the vibration of the strings to the body of the instrument. The soul is what allows the violin to resonate, to reach out, into the world. What then if we were to reach out too? If we were to let go of that the, that very definite article, and quit thinking in terms of the soul as though it were a thing, some interior component like a sound post. If we were to conceive of it instead as a quality of being. A soul that is not as a possession, not as a part of you that lives on after death or that can be lost or found or weighed, whether in church or in the lab. In fact, not as a part of you at all, but as a dimension of being, of existence. I think of this as a, an agnostic approach to soul, an, an existential one, if you like, an existentialist one, is what I mean to say. A way to open out the idea, to give it room to breathe, but then the question is, how exactly? Approach the sense of soul directly, and like sand, it, it, it slips through your fingers. Ask what's meant by saying that someone's got soul, and what comes to mind, or at least what comes to my mind, is that old advertising slogan, got milk? Soul is something you can get, something that's good to have. Of course, you could always call on a whole checklist of attributes such as generosity, genuineness, empathy, compassion, authenticity. But these all sound kind of solemn, almost reverent. Not that they're not vital, they are vital. And yet, vitality is exactly what they seem to lack when listed this way. It's as though they're weighed down by earnestness, grounded by gravity, which might be why a sense of humor is absent from that list. So, what about going with a different language altogether? The language of music, soul music. Because if soul can be said to have a heart, this surely goes right to it. Think Nina Simone, Aretha Franklin. 
music that voices deep pain, yet somehow transforms that pain into beauty. By a kind of alchemy, it makes the bitter into the hauntingly bittersweet, even into joy. And yet, couldn't it be said that all great music is really soul music? Music that moves you, that is, sometimes literally, so that I might find myself dancing to a Beethoven symphony or to the ecstatic chanting of Nusrat Fatah Ali Khan. Because music is not only an expression of soul, it's a carrier of it, which is why it is so often banned by fundamentalist regimes. Soul does not sit well with dogma. It would be tempting to say here that fundamentalists are soulless. Make that very tempting. Except, is that really possible? Only if you still think of soul as a thing, a possession. I, I mean, I can see how a soul could conceivably be owned or lost, stolen, even sold as in a Faustian pact. But the quality of soul is not a tradable commodity. So it's not that some people have no soul, but that something in them seems to have shriveled, seems to have turned in on itself as though in retreat. They've hunkered down and built a wall around themselves, sometimes even a physical wall of steel or concrete. Afraid of what's beyond, of the unknown, the other, they close the gates and post guards. They live walled off from the world, even at the extreme against the world. The thought of being against the world makes me need water. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. And if the gates were to be kept open, could soul be a matter of being brave enough to be vulnerable? To acknowledge the risks of being vulnerable, that is, and willingly accept them nonetheless, because risks they are. And those I think of as brave souls know this. In a way, they're the personification of soul music. However bitter their experience, they're not ruled by fear or by resentment. They reach out into the world instead of being guarded against it. They're open to it. Could we think then in terms of being open-souled and closed-souled? That sounds promising, open and closed-souled. And yet there's still something missing, isn't there? Some spark, some sense of energy, of life. But since I'm what you might call a stubborn soul, let me try one last time, at least for now, because, you know, those medieval diners may have been onto something when they called the lungs of the goose the soul. The lungs, the breath of life. And if the connection isn't quite there in English, it could be that English just isn't a very soulful language. Uh, I was trying to figure out if I could say that without laughing, I can't. <laughs> um, it does exist in many other places. The sister languages of Arabic and Hebrew, for instance, use related words such as nafis and nefesh, which can mean either breath or soul or spirit, or all three at the same time, intertwined, breath and soul and spirit. And there it is. There's what's been missing. Spirit, that sense of vitality. Isn't that what we need when we talk about soul? We need to make it spirited again, give it guts again, give it lungs again, because if we want to live life with soul, and I think pretty sure most of us do, we need to breathe life back into it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you.